The obvious inability by these amateurs to fly the four airplanes in the way they were flown, and the total lack of proof that they were even aboard those planes, poses a serious question. If not them, then who was piloting the planes? One thing everyone can agree on is that no professional pilot in the world would ever crash his own plane into a highly populated target like the Pentagon or the Twin Towers in New York. Even at gunpoint, once he knew his plane was doomed, at the last minute he would steer it away from a populated target or plunge it directly into the sea. I don't believe any airline pilot would intentionally fly into the World Trade Center, even with a gun at his head. It is inconceivable to me that any airline pilot would allow anyone to force him to fly into an inhabited building. I cannot imagine how any pilot could be conscious or capable of doing anything to control that airplane at the time that it was directed at one of these buildings. But then, who was in the cockpits? What may seem as a far-fetched possibility was actually suggested by TV reporters less than 10 minutes after the impact on the second tower. That is a very large aircraft would be enormously uh, significant if someone was able in some way to get their hands on a 727 or a similar sized commercial aircraft and then crash them in. Uh, Ollie? Jim, what you're saying uh, could, could be a drone aircraft. That's an aircraft that's uh, uh, guided electronically uh, to its target without having a pilot. Now that is a possibility as well. One fact that seems to support this possibility are the exceptional speeds these airplanes were able to achieve at low altitudes, near sea level. As we know, a person can easily run at top speed through normal air, but he cannot do the same in a much thicker medium like water. If he were to be pushed at the same speeds in the thicker fluid, he would probably lose his arms and legs due to the excessive resistance he encounters. The same thing can happen to airplanes if they are pushed beyond their design structural limits. At 30,000 feet, the air is very thin, and the airplane can easily travel beyond 500 miles an hour without encountering much resistance. As soon as it starts descending, however, the atmosphere gets thicker and thicker, and the plane needs to reduce the speed accordingly in order to preserve its structural integrity. Below 10,000 feet in altitude, speeds around 250 miles per hour are recommended. In fact, each airplane has a specific maximum operating velocity, called VMO, which should never be exceeded at low altitudes. Never means never for a reason. Should the VMO be exceeded, a phenomenon called flutter can occur, which can quickly cause irreversible damage. The flutter phenomenon can affect any kind of airplane, from large military bombers to small single-engine airplanes. Once the VMO is exceeded, not only are the wings and the ailerons at risk, but also the fuselage begins suffering from the air pressure caused by the speed. This is what happened to an Air China 747, which exceeded the maximum operating speed, or VMO, in the desperate effort to recover from an engine failure. For the first time, Captain Ho takes manual control of the plane. Airspeed 270, 280. The plane is about to exceed its maximum speed. Approaching VMO. The stress of the dive tears the landing gear doors off the plane. It has VMO. Emergency. Emergency. Luckily, the pilots were able to regain control of the plane and perform an emergency landing. The damage caused by the excess velocity was visible all over the plane. The maximum operating speed for a 767, two of the four hijacked airplanes, is 414 miles per hour. For the other two airplanes, the 757s, the VMO is even less, 402 miles per hour. Yet on 9-11, all four airplanes were flown at speeds close to or beyond 500 miles per hour near sea level without suffering any visible structural damage, while remaining perfectly under control all the way into their targets. American 11 hit high up in the North Tower around the 93rd floor, going a pretty astonishing rate of speed, almost 500 miles an hour. Here comes a very large target, descending rapidly, very fast. Diving very steeply and very fast. He's really moving. He was moving fast. United Flight 175, streaking through the skies over New York at more than 600 miles an hour, barely missed colliding with another commercial flight. The back of my neck stands up when we talk about the hijacking. We watched the speed, very high rate of speed. I, I believe it was about 600 knots southbound, which was extremely unusual for an air carrier. According to the NTSB, 
During the descent from 12,000 to 6,000 feet, the aircraft ground speed remained between 500 and 520 knots. It then impacted World Trade Center Tower 2 at approximately 510 knots ground speed. 510 knots is 586 miles per hour. That's almost 200 miles per hour beyond the maximum operating velocity of a 767. American 77 also impressed the air traffic controllers for the speed in approaching Washington. It was an unidentified plane to the southwest of Dulles, moving at a very high rate of speed. I slid over to the controller on my left, and I asked him, do you see an unidentified plane there southwest of Dulles? And his response was, yes. Oh my gosh, yes. Look how fast he is. Full throttle. Full out. The plane made its circular descent at about 350 miles an hour. Then it kept accelerating until it crashed into the Pentagon, says the commission report, traveling at approximately 530 miles per hour. While flying at 5,000 feet of altitude, United 93 began performing a series of hard left and right maneuvers at 350 miles per hour. This was followed by a series of similar up and down maneuvers while flying near 400 miles per hour. Yet Zihad Jarad, the amateur who wasn't allowed to fly solo on a single engine airplane, braved the roller coaster without ever losing control. As the plane was descending, he even kept accelerating until the aircraft plowed into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 580 miles per hour. These exceptional speeds achieved at low altitudes have raised more than an eyebrow among aeronautical experts and pilots alike especially those who had flown the actual airplanes involved in 9-11. I flew the two actual aircraft uh, which were involved in 9-11, the flight number 175 and flight 93, the 757 that allegedly went down at Shanksville, and flight 175 is the aircraft that's uh, alleged to have hit the South Tower. I don't believe it's possible for a terrorist, a so-called terrorist, to train on a 172, then jump in a cockpit of a 757, 767 glass cockpit, and vertical navigate the aircraft, lateral navigate the aircraft, and fly the airplane at speeds exceeding its design limit speed by well over 100 knots, make high speed, uh, high bank turns, uh, exceeding pulling po probably five, six, seven Gs, uh, and the aircraft would literally fall out of the sky. I couldn't do it, and I'm absolutely positive they couldn't do it. How do you feel about United 175 reaching 510 knots? Physically impossible. To have a, uh, a clocked airspeed of 510 knots uh, with a commercial airliner at sea level is physically impossible. Wait, 175 that hit the second tower, they said it was going at uh, roughly 560 miles an hour at sea level. No, that's impossible. You need so much power to push yourself through that air. So the engines have the right amount of horsepower for cruising at 30,000 feet at you know, 500 plus miles an hour. To do that at ground level, you need six times that amount of power. Those engines can't put out six times more power. If you changed up the motors so that they had, were motors that had six times the thrust, then you know, theoretically you could, but then the structure is not strong enough. Under, under all circumstances, I'd say an absolute resounding no. Uh, uh, to me, it's impossible. You know, any pilot that has been in a commercial jet would probably laugh at uh, if you said 510 knots. Uh, is it possible to fly over 500 miles an hour at sea level? Uh, no. It would be above the indicated uh, airspeed would be uh, greater than at uh, its maximum speed at sea level. Um, even, like say if it was even in a, like a shallow type of dive. Would it be able to any any airplane can be dive because then you've got the assistance of gravity, right? But there, there, there comes a point where the, the the drag of the air overcomes the aerodynamics of the airplane. For a final word, the same researcher has called Boeing Corporation. It has to do with uh, the maximum speed of a 767-200 at 700 feet altitude. Or 200? Uh, yeah, 767-200. Yeah. Like, I, I had asked some people, and they, they assumed it would be about 250 miles an hour or something. That sounds pretty likely, because uh, at 35,000 feet, it's 530 miles. So there's no way that uh, it, it could be going 500 miles an hour at 700 feet altitude, then? <laughs> Not a chance. Not that fast. 
Question. Can you produce any evidence that a Boeing 767 equipped with regular engines can fly for almost two minutes beyond 500 miles per hour in the lower strata of the atmosphere without suffering any visible structural damage? Can you explain how amateur pilots who had never flown a jet before in their life could maintain full control of an airliner that has exceeded the VMO by almost 200 miles per hour? And why would some terrorists who have been lucky enough to get within reach of their target want to risk the entire operation by imposing such a stress on the airplane that it would almost certainly cause them to crash before they complete their mission?